Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Welcome to the Empower Hour. Uh, I know we were having some technical issues a little bit earlier, so we're getting started a few minutes late. Um, I'm hoping that more people will show up. We have m multiple people registered, and so I'm hoping uh, that people will be persistent and try to get in. Um, and you can always, uh, you know, give us uh, a message on our support channel if you're having issues in the future, and we'll try to make sure we get uh, all those technical things covered. But uh, I will keep an eye on the chat today, and I also have something I want to talk about, um, so we will do that if time permits. So question number one that was uh, sent during the week. Some prominent Christians are saying we don't need to forgive someone unless they repent because God does not forgive us until we repent. Is it ever biblically, is it biblically ever okay to hold bitterness or hardness of heart towards someone? Can it be backed up biblically that we should forgive all people? I would hope so, but I'm currently concerned and confused about this issue. Saying, we don't need to forgive someone unless they repent. Let's stop there. All right, so here we have a, a software that I use. Can everyone see that? Um, and this is BibleHub.com. So this is a great uh, resource that I like to use. And you can see here we've got, uh, you know, multiple verses or, or multiple translations of a verse. And then over here in this section, we have an area that gives us some greater context, cross-references on the right-hand side. And uh, if you scroll down, you can even see other uh other verses that are somewhat related. And if we scroll all the way down, all the way down, all the way down, we start to see some commentaries that are speaking to this specific verse. And then you can also get links to some of the Greek or Hebrew concordances. And you can see sort of the root words. And and uh, in the future, we'll, we'll talk more about that. So First things first, um, the question is, some prominent Christians are saying we don't need to forgive someone unless they repent. So what does God say here? And I'll just read from the ESV. If you for, This is in the Lord's Prayer, right? This is Jesus speaking, telling us how this is a way for us to pray regularly. So this is a core teaching that, that God wants us to know about. If you forgive others their trespasses, also uh, the, the word trespass here is, uh, is translated as sin in Matthew and in, I believe, uh, Luke, it is trans, is it Luke? Either Luke or Mark, it's translated as debts. Um, I believe it's Mark. Anyway, that's what trespasses is. It's it's sin in some uh, in one book, and it is debt in another book. And so, if you forgive others their sins or debts, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And I'm just going to go ahead and go like this, so we can see both verses side by side. So this is what Jesus wants us to pray. We're asking God. Forgive us our debts, right? Our, our sins, so sins or debts. Forgive us our trespasses, as we also have forgiven our debtors, right? And so we're asking God, forgive us just in the same way that we have forgiven others. And then Jesus tells us explicitly after this, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. 
So should we forgive people only if they're willing to repent? Is that what God wants us to do? No, we we are to forgive them because God forgives us. We're to forgive them because God forgives us. And so, um, so the latter half of this verse, the question was, God does not forgive us until we repent. God does not forgive us until we repent. And so, uh, we we want to get away from this error of thinking, I'm I'm saved, I'm forgiven, but if I sin, then I fall back down. And then if I repent, then I'm saved again. And if I sin, then I'm not saved until I repent. And if I repent, then I'm saved again and forgiven. And so we keep our ultimate forgiveness is based on this ongoing need to repent over and over and over again. And if we ever fall short in that area, then we're not forgiven. And our sins are held against us. And so that's an extremely dangerous teaching that actually uh, gets us closer to something like what Roman Catholics believe, um, although they would say it's not any sin. It's only mortal sins that cause you to lose your salvation, lose your forgiveness, step outside of or be cast outside of God's forgiveness until we repent, and then we can be forgiven again. That's not true. We are justified by faith alone in the finished work of Jesus alone. And so it's not our um it's not that singular act of repentance that is needed in order for us to be forgiven. It's that the overall um, posture of repentance. It's that overall, we, we were going in one direction, rebelling against God. We repented. We, did, we turned around. We did, repentance means to turn and go back in the opposite direction. So we repented from our rebellion to God, did a 180 and started following God and started walking towards him. And along that walking of that journey, we'll stumble and we'll fall short. We'll make mistakes. Um, I believe we, we covered this in last week's uh, episode. We were, um, it, you know, we'll fall short. We'll we'll make mistakes. We might sin. We might even intentionally sin, give in to temptation. But it's that posture of repentance. Uh, once we're born again, we are in a position of being forgiven of all of our sins. So once we're born again, we're made a new creation and we are in Christ and we are justified, meaning we are declared innocent and blameless under the law according to God. So we are obviously forgiven if we are justified and blameless. And so in Matthew uh, 18, Starting at verse 21, it says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Or that could also be translated as seventy times seven. Right? So how many times does God want us to forgive people? As many times as it takes. Okay? So it says there, he said, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. So this is like millions of dollars. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. So this is us. We have this 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 enormous sin debt against God because he is righteous and holy and we are far from righteous. We're sinful and God sees us 
and he says, "Okay, I will have pay. I will have pity. You know, pity on you. I will have, you know, I will give you grace and mercy." And he releases him. It says, "Out of pity for him, uh, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt." This is God forgiving us our debt. And then it says, "But when that servant came." went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So he has this little small amount that he's owed, this little small sin against him, that an offense against him. And he's like, you, you are, you're going to get, a, you're going to have to pay exactly what you owe. I'm not going to give you grace or mercy. His fellow servant fell fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. They went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. So this is what God says to us. I gave you grace and mercy and forgave you of all the sins you did against me. I let the blood of my son cover over all of your sin. And it wasn't because you were great and righteous and you paid me back. It was my own mercy, my own grace. And if we go out and hold people against that, hold their sins against us, instead of giving them the same grace and mercy that God has shown us, it's, it's actually the first sign is that we have not been saved yet. If we have truly received God's forgiveness and truly embraced the gospel, then that should transform our heart and mind so that we also extend that same love and grace and mercy towards other people. And if we are hard-hearted and hateful and bitter and are unwilling to forgive other people, then it means that we probably have not been transformed by the gospel and we might not even be saved. And at the very least, even if we have been saved, this is something that we actually touch on in in the Freedom Friday program and in deliverance because there is a consequence to your unforgiveness. And so here's what God says. So even if you're saved, worst case scenario, you're not even saved. If you're not extending this same grace and mercy and forgiveness to other people, you might not be saved. But let's say you are saved. There's still a consequence for these singular, let, let's say you, you forgive most people, but there's one person you're really having a hard time forgiving because they're not repenting and this is what god says this is what jesus says in his parable he goes um should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as i had mercy on you and he says and in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So there are, he's, he has given this person who is unwilling to forgive the one who sinned against him. He is given over to the jailers, right? Those, the executors of the punishment of his sin until he should pay all of his debt. Right, And so you actually reap the consequences of your own sin against God if you are unwilling to forgive the sin of the person who sinned against you. So what we actually see is when there's – a lot of times when people are being tormented by demons or having some kind of demonic stronghold in their life – they are having unforgiveness in their heart. And so the demons sort of come in and say, we have a legal right to be here. And we are harming and hurting this person. 
but we have a right to do so. We have a right to do so. And the person may say, well, wh I'm, but I'm saved. Why, does, why are there demons in my life? And this, this parable that Jesus taught teaches this principle that if you still have sin that can be held against you, then the enemy has a right to be in your life. And so it's a little bit of a, of a segue away from, from the question, but I think there's a powerful principle there. You need to, you need to forgive. Um, you need to forgive other people whether or not they repent, whether or not they repent. And I've heard it said that uh, holding bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart against someone is like swallowing poison and hoping it kills the other guy. It kills you when you hang on to the unforgiveness and the bitterness. It kills you. It, it, it prevents your restoration to your relationship with God. It prevents your uh, walking in the blessings and the provision given to us by Jesus because you're holding yourself in that prison. You're, you think you're keeping that person who hurt you in a prison, but really you're keeping yourself in this prison. This, you know, the, in this parable, it says God is the one who puts you in the prison, but you're the one choosing to be there because you're unwilling to forgive the person who harmed you. And because you're unwilling to do that, God doesn't excuse you from the consequences of your own sin against him. Um, and so the other part of that, is it biblically ever okay to hold bitterness or hardness? Uh, no, no, it's never okay. Um, this is what Jesus has to say. In Matthew 5.44, he says, you know, in 43, it says, you have heard that it was said, love your enemy." Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. These people are not repentant. They're not repentant. They are still your enemy. They are still persecuting you. But if we're willing to do that, we are sons of our Father in heaven. We're more like him when we forgive those who are after us. And we can look at some other uh, cross-references, right? Luke 6.27, Jesus said, But to those of you who will listen, say, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, right? Bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Even Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Right? This is what God's will is for us. So no, we should not hold bitterness. We should not hold hardness of heart. It will hurt us. It will hurt us. Um, can it be backed up biblically that we should forgive all people? Hopefully I've done a sufficient job enough uh, to cover it. This is a super important thing. Your unwillingness to do it will cause harm to your relationship with God. It will cause harm to your ability to be fully, uh, to walk in freedom from uh, demonic influence and bondage. It will uh, cause you to hinder the work of the Holy Spirit, which includes love, peace, joy. So in Galatians. 5 verses 22 and 23. So these are characteristics of the presence of the Holy Spirit in you. It includes love. You need to act loving towards other people. That's what the Holy Spirit wants you to be doing. You need to be pursuing peace. Peace first with you and God, and the forgiveness is necessary for that. And peace with other people. Peace with other people. Uh, that's a fruit of the Spirit. Um, Paul wrote, uh, do not repay evil, anyone evil for evil, right? Don't, 
don't go out of your way to hurt the people who are trying to hurt you. And as Matthew 5 described, that's in the heart too. It doesn't mean don't just murder the person who's trying to murder you. Don't have hatred in your heart, which would be murder of the heart against the person who maybe murdered someone you loved. Don't even hate them. Don't repay evil for evil. Carefully consider what is right in the eyes of everybody. And if it is possible on your part, live at peace with everyone. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So what does God want you to do? He wants you to live in forgiveness and in pursue peace with everyone and forgive them whether they repent or not. Um, you know, he, and, and I'll actually, I'm going to turn, the, I'll turn this into another question just so it's not a super long question. But a lot of times people ask me this question, do I need to forgive people who are not willing to repent because my spouse won't repent or this friend or family member or person in my church or this politician or whoever is evil and they won't repent? Do I need to still support them? Do I still need to... Now, obviously, if it's a... Uh, spouse, then there's a deeper level of involvement. Um, but let's say it's a friend. Let's say I have a friend who continues to sin and won't repent. And now we already read earlier, Jesus said, he told Peter, forgive him 70 times seven or 77 times, right? As many times as it takes, forgive them. But we need to understand the difference. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Forgiveness means that you are no longer holding against them the consequences of their sin as though you're their judge, as though you're the one who determines their punishment and are holding that wrath in your heart against them. Right, that's what it, the the verse we just read. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. He's the judge. He's the one who sees all the details. Who he, who knows their entire life, everything they've been through, every single thought, every single feeling, all of it. He's the one who can judge and determine what is right or wrong for this person. We don't need to be in that place. We can't be in that place. And we, we shouldn't want to be in that place where, like, I'm going to decide that they, don't, they haven't repented yet. It's up to me, and I don't think it was um, sincere. And so I'm, I'm going to hold it against them. We don't want that burden. We have, we have to forgive them and release them to the Lord. Let him decide. I guarantee everyone one of two things will happen. They will either find Jesus at some point, truly repent of their sin, and be forgiven and covered by the blood of Christ and have a transformed life, or they will rise at the resurrection and appear at the great white throne judgment on the last day and have to answer to God for every single one of their sins. So they will not be getting away with it just because we choose to forgive them. They are still going to have these sins dealt with. They are either going to have to bring it to Jesus and confess that sin and lay it down and, and you know, and have to, sometimes we have to make restitution. Like if you've stolen from somebody, you need to make it right with them before God forgives you. You can't just say, I'm sorry, God, and then, Keep what you stole, right? And so they might have to do that as well. They might have to confess their sin. And so either that or they answer to it on Judgment Day. Either way, justice will be served. So we don't have to be the one who decides that we will execute the justice and the wrath. God will do it. Our forgiveness is us saying, God, I release them to you. You choose. You choose. And if we are unwilling to do, you know, if they're unwilling to do that, they'll have demons and they'll have other consequences of that, of that decision. And so, um, 
But there's a difference between forgiveness and restoration. I can forgive someone, my brother, like my brother who sins against me 70 times. I can choose to forgive him. But I don't have to go out of my way to have a, a, a good relationship with him. I don't have to keep inviting him over for dinner every night if he's going to sin against me every day. Right? I Just because I'm choosing not to hold wrath or hatred in my heart against him doesn't mean I have to be friends with him. Because you don't have to do that. When we tell people, this is true of you know, the person who murdered someone in your family. It's true of the person who molested you or raped you or who stole from you or whatever evil was done that you have a hard time forgiving this person for. You don't have to pursue a relationship with that person. In fact, a lot of people, we should actively distance ourselves from and not have a relationship with those people because they're toxic, harmful people who um, are, they need to feel the distance in the relationship. And, you know, in first Corinthians, Paul was talking to them about this guy who was sleeping with his father's wife. And he said, he won't repent. He said, remove this person from your church. He goes, hand them over to Satan. And hopefully the Lord would bring them to repentance. And so he wasn't allowed back into the church fellowship until he repented and saw and admitted that what he was doing was evil. So this way the church communicates, you're not okay. You're not in the right place with God unless you repent. And you're not in right relationship with us unless you repent. But that is different than us saying, we're going to hold it against you and have hatred and bitterness in our heart or being the one to execute the justice and wrath for God. We say, no, I'm just going to leave you out there, unprotected by the church, unprotected by your relationship with God. And Satan's going to have his way with you and he's going to beat you up. And God will hopefully use that to help you bring, help you come to repentance, right? Sometimes Satan needs to beat us down for a while the, the natural consequences of our sinful rebellion. And then hopefully God gives people the wisdom and they turn and they repent. They wake up after getting beat around. And so, no, but we never want to hang on to it ourselves, and, um, and we want to have those parameters where we're not pursuing a relationship with an abusive, toxic person. You don't need to keep them in your life. And if, it, and, and if this was a spouse, separate from the spouse and don't reconcile until they get the help that they need until they repent. You can forgive them right now in this very moment, in this minute, but you don't have to pursue reconciliation of, a, of the relationship unless they're willing to repent. Okay. All right. So... I talked for a lot. Let me take a look at the notes and see if um, if there's any uh, any follow up um, part that I didn't cover. Um, one person said it could be very bad to have hardness of heart towards a spouse. It uh, basically encourages divorce. So this makes sense that God would require us to forgive our spouse. Yeah, and we, we need to forgive everyone. Hopefully I've made that case. Um, let's see. Yeah, yep, we, we got to forgive no matter what um, and pursue reconciliation. Like Paul wrote, pursue peace whenever possible. As far as on your part, that's what he said. As far as, um, let's see. Where was that? That was Romans 12, 18. If it is possible on your part, live at peace with everyone, right? If it, When it comes to you, quickly forget, forgive everybody. And if you can, have a re great relationship, reconciliation with everyone. But if, they're, but if they're not willing to have a relationship with you, if they're not willing to have peace, right, in a non-abusive, non-toxic, non, you know, 
relationship that will break down your faith and your relationship with God and your health, um, that's not being at peace. <laughs> and so, but as far as it goes on your part, live at peace with everyone. Um, and as far as what they do, sometimes we need to hand them over to Satan for the destruction and hopefully uh, God will bring them to repentance. Um, all right, here we have another question. Uh, you said in your book that you used to be Catholic. This is true. Uh, what is the biggest reason you personally chose to become Protestant? Um, I Well, I was raised Catholic, and while I didn't – I mean, I didn't have a close relationship with God, but I did believe. I did believe. Um, even during my really sinful uh, high school years, I was getting into all kinds of stuff. Um, I still maintained belief. I still wore crosses. I still had crosses around my room, like as wall art. I had all kinds of stuff, um, but I was living in wickedness. And I eventually, you know, was arrested and and uh, was looking for. Um, I, I started to get my life back together, and I, I think it was my senior year. And I was I was doing all of these other things, you know. I was I was working full time, and and you know had had a new girlfriend that was going well, and getting good grades in school, and not hanging out with all the drug dealers and all the stuff that I was involved in before that. And I I was you know restoring my relationship with my parents, and 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 not doing drugs myself, and all kinds. And so on paper, I was doing really well. But I knew I felt like there was something missing, and I remember driving around one night, and I just felt like this lack in my life, and I was sort of crying out to the universe, like, I don't know what I'm missing. What, what am I looking for? And I, I think I'd even pulled over um, in a church parking lot, and I felt the Lord uh, Jesus say to me you lost your first love. And I hadn't even really realized that he once was my first love. Like I didn't even, I never had that relationship where I was like talking with God all the time or anything, at least as far as I remember, um, I, I hadn't. And so it was at that moment, I was 17 and I really, God spoke to me and said like, you need me, you need me. And it was at that point, I was 17, and I knew I needed God. I just sensed in my spirit, it, the truth just wasn't found at the Catholic Church. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I went to a Baptist church with the girlfriend and her family, and I think I only went once or twice, but I remember just feeling something in my spirit like this is right this is better um there was just something about the whole catholic system that just fell off and over the the next you know years whenever i had a tough uh a tough season or trial or decision to make or i needed direction I would drive to that, so I never got plugged into a church, which is why I didn't really give my life fully into the Lord for another 13 years, unfortunately. But even during those early years, when I was struggling, I would drive to my old Catholic church, and they had a, a, a chapel in the back that was always open. And so you had like the big area, and then you had this little small chapel area where it was just you know enough room for 50 people or so. And, I, and they, had, they had it open 24 hours a day. And so I would go there, and I would just kneel and sit and pray and talk to God personally. And I just felt like I can talk to God personally, and I can pray, and I can hear from him. And he would minister to me and speak to me and give me direction and give me hope and give me what I needed. He would, I would leave feeling like my prayers were answered and that God was, had spoken to me. And I was not, I didn't understand 
deep theology at the time. I didn't understand charismatic gifts. None of that stuff. Um, I, I just, I just, I guess the Holy Spirit might have ministered to me and led me in this direction. But I was, I just felt like it's the Catholic system where I have to go and confess my sins to a priest and then say a Hail Mary. And like, I'm like, where does the Mary thing even like what that's like, even during my struggle, I'm grateful that I didn't go to Mary for the answer. Jesus was like, you need me, you need God. Um, and so I'm just, I'm grateful that the Lord just kind of protected me from really getting absorbed into that stuff. Um, even though that's what I was sort of brought up in. And so, um, I just kind of, I just kind of knew it wasn't right. I knew that I needed a personal relationship with God. I didn't need intermediaries. I didn't need Mary. I didn't need the saints. I didn't need an angel like Michael or Gabriel. And I didn't need the priest. I just needed God. And I guess God just taught me that. Um, and that just stuck with me. And it took, you know, it took many years later for me to really dive into the the theology of the Catholic catechism and the teaching and the history and all that stuff. And then that then I became more and more and more and more convinced that Protestantism is the truth and Catholicism went down some some paths that it shouldn't have. Okay, so following up with um, that, I have this question. Cameron Bertuzzi, a popular Protestant Christian apologist on YouTube, is strongly considering becoming a Catholic. I'm emotionally troubled by this as I am trying to process and understand why a Protestant would make this decision. Any advice for me? as I am emotionally bothered with this. Um, you know, another a, another example that shook a lot of people was a man named Hank Hanegraaff, who I, th I think he had a show called, was it the Bible, the Bible Answer Man or something like that. Um, I didn't watch it, but this, I guess it was before my time. But I guess he was a popular evangelical Protestant teacher, Bible teacher, and then he converted within the last few years to Eastern Orthodoxy, which is sort of uh, kind of like the third branch of the the Christian uh, uh denominations for lack of a better word sort of you have this biblical foundation and then you have the early church starting and then you have like the western uh latin roman side of things and then the the greek eastern side of things and then the western one went off and ended up morphing into what we would now know as Roman Catholicism, and then the Eastern one went off and, uh, you know, went to the Byzantine area, era and then ended up becoming what we would now kind of classify as like the Orthodox Church. Um, and so he became Orthodox after being a Protestant for a long time, and it threw a lot of people off. And so um, why would a person do this? I, I mean, ultimately, you'd have to ask them. I mean, there's no there's no one way to know for sure, but um, or as why a person would want to become a Catholic. I would say, as far as the Catholic thing goes, some people uh, really enjoy. Now, a lot of these arguments actually, a person could become like a Lutheran or uh, you know part of the Anglican Church or the Presbyterian Church because these are all kind of liturgical and very kind of systematic in the way that they do things, very ritual-based, kind of very organized. Um, and so, but a lot of people like that about the Catholic Church. They like they like the, the organ playing. They like 
the the liturgy which is when you have like formal creeds and statements and like like everything follows a formula it has like a very specific way of doing the regular uh meeting which is called the mass in the catholic church and so they have a very systematic way of doing it very it's very religious very uh devout feeling very um it, it it can feel very, um, I guess, somber might be a, a way to describe it. It's very, um, it feels like, almost like if you went to like a funeral, it would be like, we're in a very serious place doing a very serious thing. And we're doing something really important here. And everyone takes it seriously. Um, it just has that feeling to it. Uh, whereas if you go to a lot of the Protestant churches, now again, like there's some of the the more liturgical ones that that would be closer to the Catholic way of doing it, but you know if you go to a lot of the evangelical Protestant churches, it's more you know Holy Spirit led and charismatic, and you've got you know people playing guitar and you know kind of more it's more bright and loud and there's preaching and there's all this kind of um, it's a very very different environment and way of understanding God and worshiping God. And so some people, they, they enjoy the, the highly religious aspect because it feels more sacred. It feels more authentic to them. Now I would say um, the distinctives of Catholicism, they may, they may um, see the, you know, I, I would say maybe they see the lack of people confessing their sins. And so they like a system like the priest confessional system where people are supposed to confess their sins. You know, you're not, you're not even supposed to go have the Eucharist or the Mass, which is their version of the Lord's Supper, unless you go confess your sins first. Now, probably a lot of people still do anyway, but you're not supposed to. And so I think that's actually kind of a good aspect, like, you need to be holy before you participate in the Lord's Supper. That's a good practice. I think Protestants need to be probably expressing that. Um, I do it, but but a lot don't. Um, and so I think we need to take our holiness seriously. Um, they, they may uh, trust in the historicity of the, of the Catholic Church and and. That's not to say it's historically true. What I mean is it it they they appeal to their the length of time that they've been doing it the way that they've been doing it. They say we've always done it this way. We're the original church. We're, you know, 2000 years old. And so that's not actually true. <laughs> but they, the Catholic Church does sort of present themselves as though they've always done it this way. This is the way that the original apostles did it, and this is the way Peter did it, and so forth. Um, and so um, that could appeal to some people. They might think, okay, this is, it's more, it's more of a religious thing that has historical roots to it, whereas obviously, you know, the apostles weren't playing guitars and, and, you know, and, and they didn't have strobe lights and, and, and all these kind of things that the Protestants might be doing in, in the evangelical world. Um, and so not strobe lights, but you know, the, the lights on the, uh, you know, from even the pulpit is there's like cool designs and backgrounds and all this kind of stuff. And it's just, it's, it tries to keep up with culture in a lot of ways. Um, and some, are really turned off by that idea. They want something that's that feels historical, that feels ancient, that feels religious and reverent. And so uh, some people could be drawn to the Catholic Church from that. Uh, any advice for why um, why they would make that decision, being emotionally bo bothered by it? You know, just because they were a cat a Christian apologist doesn't mean 
you know, I guess it depends what kind of apologist you are, right? An apologist is just one who makes defense of something. And so a Christian apologist makes a defense of Christian beliefs and and sort of the case for Christianity. And so, but if they spent their time doing apologetics against false religions, against uh, Christian cults, against atheism and neo-Darwinian evolution and all these kind of things, they may have very little ability to discern what is actually wrong in Catholic doctrine and practice. And if they've never become first an apologist at Christian doctrine, if they've never first practiced, um, you know, becoming educated and disciplined in theology, right, and in and in where they trust the original source of what is authoritative, right? Because Protestants, it's all it's sola scriptura. It's scripture alone, the Bible alone. The Bible is our authority. If it's in the Bible, we believe it. If it's not in the Bible, we're going to be very cautious and we're going to reject everything that's not consistent with the Bible. Whereas the Catholic Church is it's scripture plus tradition. They believe that the all of the early um the early church fathers, which are basically early church leaders, their writings are authoritative too. All of the the popes over the centuries, their declarations were authoritative too. And so they sort of combine all of this stuff as well as supposedly verbal verbal things that were passed down by the apostles that weren't written down in the New Testament, supposedly. And so they sort of take all that and say all that's authoritative, not just the Bible. And so – and then they tend to actually favor some of the other things over the Bible. And so they're willing to do things that seem unbiblical, and they believe it's the right thing because it's coming from this other tradition source. And so if a person who was being drawn to Catholicism wasn't investigating uh, Catholic doctrine and comparing it extremely carefully to Protestant doctrine – and saying which one is true, let me compare and contrast and, and and really investigate this carefully. If they were an apologist but only studied the other stuff and never became disciplined in this stuff, then they really uh, – they're no easier to convince to become a Catholic than any other random person on the street who believes in a God, Right? Because they already believe in Jesus, they already believe in God, they already believe that the cross happened, they already believe all that stuff, and so it's just they just think it's a choice, it's just a preference, right? Like choosing to be Presbyterian or Baptist, just eh, it's just a preference, you know? You're you're Presbyterian, I'm Baptist, no big deal. You you like the organ music, I like I like guitar, no big deal. But the difference is Catholic doctrine is in some ways fundamentally different than Protestant doctrine. And so it's not just a preference. But we need to know that, and we need to investigate it carefully, and we need to know, do we trust the tradition sources, or do we trust Bible? What do we trust? Who do we trust? And so these are important things. Um and just because a person was popular, just because he was an apologist about something, doesn't mean he carefully vetted these things. Um, and, you know, even if he did, I don't know anything about him, but uh, even if he did carefully vet these things, that doesn't mean he can't make an error. You know, and so we're all fallible. 
um, and Satan is pulling people into error in any way he can. And so maybe there's maybe his you know maybe there's a loved one or a spouse that's Catholic that's pulling him towards that direction. I, who knows? It could be anything. Uh, I don't know. So maybe it's a, a complete. Uh, maybe it's more of a personally emotional decision. It has nothing to do with intellectually carefully walking through the differences. I I don't know. Um, so um. Was the so I have a few minutes, and since this has uh, been Catholic focused in the last half hour here, we'll just do this other one that's about Catholicism. Was the early church soon after Jesus basically Catholic? Some people argue against Protestant beliefs because of this. Um, the original word, the word Catholic actually means universal, and so. Yes, it, the early church was the universal church. So it was Catholic in that sense, which is why like the Apostles' Creed says the we you know we're we're pledging allegiance to we believe in one Catholic church. It's a lowercase c Catholic church, the universal church, the universal body of everyone who belongs to Jesus. Um and so yes, it was Catholic in that sense. Um, and there was, but was it Catholic, meaning did the early church look like Roman Catholicism does today? Not at all. Not at all. Um, because the earliest witness of what the earliest church looked like is the pages of the New Testament. That's the early witness. That's what the early church looked like. And then even if you look at some of the other early writings like the Didache or, you know, some of the earliest church fathers, they're, you know, the earliest, um, you know, and these would include some of the earliest apologists like Justin Martyr and Irenaeus. They, they sort of describe the way that things are being done. And but ultimately no, they are they're gathering in home churches for the first two hundred years. There are the the lead, There were two levels in in a local congregation. Uh, there there was well three levels. There was elder, then there was deacon, and then there was everybody else. And the the elder would be like the administrator and or the pastors, and then you know and you had a fivefold ministry. Right. So you have in Ephesians 4, verse 11, it says, Jesus gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds or pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And so you have you kind of have these five primary roles that are given to the whole church and the goal is is to equip the saints, which is everybody else. All believers are called saints in the New Testament who are responsible for the work of the ministry. And they're the body of Christ. And so, you know, if you look at Roman Catholicism, it's not like that at all. You have this higher class, you have this pope, this higher class of people. Then you have a person who oversees each local congregation called the parish and they are a priest there you know you have a few altar people but the vast majority of people are called the laity they're not doing the ministry at all really they're not even being trained and equipped to do the ministry in fact there there isn't even a i mean other than like a catechism class which is really about learning teaching it's not really about training for ministry they don't even have a formal system for small groups or for um, for ministering to people or any of that kind of stuff. And so it's really about the priest doing everything because it's all focused on the sacraments that they're responsible for. And so there's, there's a division between the people who are all holy and then the laity, which is the vast majority of everybody else. In fact, until after the Protestant Reformation, people didn't even have a copy of their own Bible, and a lot of them weren't even being read the Bible from in a la in a 
language that they even understood. They were being, it was being communicated in Latin when the vast majority of people didn't even understand Latin. And it was, so it's like this religious activity that gave them all this power. And, you know, the Roman Catholic Church grew to a ton of power and wealth. And the people didn't necessarily have a close relationship with God at all. Um, and so, and there's all these other false beliefs that, that came in as well. Now they're worshiping Mary and they're worshiping saints and they're praying to Mary. They're praying to the saints. They're praying to angels. This is super unbiblical and extremely dangerous. And, uh, it actually dishonors God and hinders a person's relationship with God. And then there's also other aspects. I'll, I'll mention one other lack of one, which is this idea that you're saved by faith plus works. And so if you've ever heard Protestants say, like, we're saved by uh, grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, right? We're saved by God's grace alone. We didn't do anything to earn it. Because of our faith alone, all we did was believe and trust in Jesus and nothing else. In the finished work of Christ alone, he did 100% of everything that was needed. The reason we say it that way is because the Catholic Church spent, uh, you know, basically from the 5th century onward, they spent 1,100 years until the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century to or 15th century, to uh, literally uh, teach that you're saved by your faith plus your works, the good stuff that you do. And then that gets you into a place of where you're saved. But if you do a mortal sin, then you're not saved anymore until you confess your sin and then do your penance with the priest and then you're back and you keep you could go back and forth and you don't even know if you're saved for sure until later and then even if you are saved the vast majority of people don't even get to go to heaven right when they're saved they got to go to purgatory first and pay off the rest of their sins in order to be purified enough in order to go to heaven so all of this stuff completely contradicts stuff in the new testament and so is that does that look like what the early church looked like? Not at all. Not at all. All this stuff contradicts what the early church believes, which is shown in the pages of the New Testament. And so why do people think that the Catholic Church is the one true church? Because people in the Catholic Church kept telling people over and over again, and they have power and authority, and, and it seems like they believe it, and, they're, and they've been around a long time, and they say it like they mean it. Um, and a lot of people might be very well-intentioned, but they're still believing and repeating a lie. And so, um, yep, nope. So the Protestant church is much more biblical, much closer to the truth of what the early church looked like. Now, that's not to say we're, we're not, we don't have the liberty to have a liturgical church that does things in that kind of way. We can. If, if you want to have liturgy instead of this evangelical charismatic thing, you're free to do that in Christ. Um, but we each need to choose what, um, what we believe is the truth. And we shouldn't quickly just do the thing that our parents told us to do or the thing that that other person down the street told us to do. We should carefully investigate these things. We should know the Bible first and foremost – and let that be our source of authority. And because adding all this tradition and all these other ideas and all these other beliefs and culture and other people's opinions, that's a quick way to deception. Satan has been doing that since Genesis 3. Did God really say, no, here's, what, here's the truth. Did the Bible really say, which is God's word, no, nah, here's the truth. He's still doing it. So... Um, all right, so that's the Empower Hour for this week. Um, hopefully that was a blessing, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna work on getting 
um, all this technology stuff uh, working perfectly, hopefully, um, so that way I can pull the scriptures up and uh, hopefully have a way where I can have both me and the scripture up at the same time and, and some things like that. So um, I will definitely, because I, I, I think it's powerful when we can just look at the word together. Um, and I'll just, I have to work on my, my skills at finding stuff very quickly. <laughs> so that way we're not dragging out the, uh, and you don't have me sitting around looking for four minutes before I start talking. So, all right, well, God bless you. And, uh, hopefully we'll catch you on Friday for, um, Freedom Friday. I've also changed as many of you guys will see, um, I've been changing this, and so even at the lower membership levels, even if you only have a little bit of money to help out, um, to partner with us, to help us keep doing what we're doing, um, we want to make these live shows available to you. And then if you have the ability to partner with us at the higher level, um, then we provide a bunch of other things, other courses. And I'm working on a bunch of other things to give you even more value, but I appreciate your partnership. I appreciate your guys' prayers and your blessings and donations. Um, go and be empowered in Jesus.